Meet Them Aquanics is now sponsored by Audible.com. As part of this sponsorship, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a 30-day trial so you can check out the range of titles that they're offering. Currently, Audible has over 180,000 books to choose from for either your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. To help support this podcast, please go to www.audibletrial.com slash McQuanics. And now, on with our next episode. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks again for listening. Uh, in this particular episode of Meet McQuanics with Dr. James Wooden, we had some problems uh, with the audio. Um, there's actually quite a significant section about 10 minutes in where the audio just got so bad that we had to get him to reboot his computer. Um, I've cut that section out uh, in this podcast, but the original version is still on YouTube uh, along with this this cut version. Um, so you can go back and compare the two if you're interested to what he has to say and you can tolerate listening to the interference. Um, the interference does sort of come back now and again, but it sort of lasts about half a sentence and then it sort of dies away. Um, so I've left that in. Um, apologies if it sounds a bit irritating. Uh, also in this podcast, he was demonstrating his game, De Tadoku. Um, in that case, he was sharing his screen from his computer to sort of demonstrate what was going on. Uh, unfortunately, SoundCloud doesn't allow me to update or upload a, a video podcast. It's audio only. So if that's the case, I w- would certainly um, encourage you to go to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash um if you're interested in the video that's sort of demonstrating uh, his game Dekodoku as he's talking about it. Um, so thanks again uh, for tolerating this uh, and for tolerating the audio problems that we seem to have on a, on a pretty regular basis, unfortunately. Thank you. Well, hello everyone again. Uh, welcome to this next episode of Meet the McQuanics. Um, thanks for joining in. Uh, this one was quite quick after our last episode with, with Michael Brett of, of Pew Branch. Um, and that's uh, for a very specific reason. We've tried to time this well um, because we have another quantum game uh, in the landscape to join uh, several of the others, including McQuanics. Um, and this one's being produced by Dr. James Wooten um, from the University of Basel in Switzerland, and he has joined us today to give us a bit of a rundown of what his project is and hopefully get some more of you involved. So, James, uh, thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. So, uh, first of all, as I, as I generally like to do, is, is give the listeners a, a bit of a brief CV, um, sort of how you got into this, um, what's your background, uh, and then we'll get started talking about um, your specific project. Was, which, as I mentioned, is, uh, is another quantum game. Yeah, so, um, well, my, my CV is probably the, one of the example of one of the main routes to the, to the field. So I got a PhD, oh, sorry, a degree in, in physics. And then I did a, um, uh, that was just a bachelor's, and I did a master's by research. And I, I chose for that a project um, in quantum information. It was on, the, it was on anonymous broadcasting which actually we should have a paper out eventually, 10 years after I did my master's, we might have a paper out on that. And then <laughs> I, I went up to the University of Leeds uh, with uh, Dr. Yanis Pachos, and he was getting into topological quantum computation at the time, so using anions, particles known as anions, to uh, do quantum computation. And so that's how I got into uh, that field. And I've mostly been working in quantum error correction with anions ever since. Um, so then I moved uh, here to Basel as a postdoc. And so you've uh, basically come to my attention because you're another player now in this sort of quantum game landscape uh, with this new project yeah. called uh, Dekodoku. Uh, mm-hmm. And this is also, it's, it's quite close to McQuantics in that it's based on the same uh, model of quantum computation. Uh, so yeah. give us a bit of a rundown of, of just the idea behind this and, and how you sort of came about deciding to turn this into a game? Um, well, the, the, the story behind me uh, coming up with the idea of a game is I was at a conference in Arosa. I like to say this is the best quantum idea that anyone's ever had in Arosa, uh, beating <laughs> Brodinger and his wave equation. Um, and um, someone from the technology transfer asked me if there's any inventions I might be able to contribute to them. And I sort of laughed in their face because I'm a theorist. Mm-hmm. in quite the abstract corner of theory. But uh, then I started thinking and I realized that I could gamify some of the research and get people involved in it like that. So unfortunately, I had to cut some of the conversation here. 
simply because uh, the microphone on James's side just got so bad and we were getting so much feedback that it was really becoming, you know, unlistenable. Um, I've uploaded this to YouTube as a separate clip. Um, therefore, if you want to go back and try and listen to the original, you can, although the audio does get quite bad by the time we, we cut and try to, to fix it up from James's side. Um, otherwise, if you're listening to this on SoundCloud or iTunes, um, we tried to rehash a lot of what we talked about before and tried to, to simply redo it. So uh, apologies for this. Ooh, looks like James is back. James. Yeah, how's that? That has cleaned it right up. So let, hopefully it will remain that way. So what we might do is um, we'll, we'll just take it from the top again for this sort of demo about the game and then uh, yeah. I'll re-edit it all this up uh, offline Sounds just like so that. yeah Apologies so people can actually unfortunate enough to be here live. No, no, no no it sometimes happens uh, obviously if you catch it and try to solve the problem it, uh, it makes it a bit easier so okay well, we'll basically do what we just did again right, so um, is it is it still fine yeah it's fine at the moment okay so the fan has come back on and it is no longer affecting us so yeah, so it must have been something else, something, something no, contaminating I, I, the optical fiber between you. I and did so. a, I did a few settings and whatnot to try and, I I've already told it not to use the onboard fan, uh, the onboard mic, but I told it again, in yeah. a different way. <laughs> I have to move the computer sometimes. Yeah, I don't know you can you can never control it. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. It's really annoying. right. So. Apologies that I'm spending a few moments plugging things in. No, no, that's fine. But uh, other than that, let's go back to Unity. Okay, that's cleaned up a lot better, so we can actually hear you clearly now. Okay. Uh, okay, so we're going to we're going to start this little tutorial again on Decadog. Group. Yeah. So let's maybe this time. Oh. Well, I shouldn't say this time because we could pretend on the on the edit that this is the only time there ever was. Yes, this is the first time we did it. Yeah, there, there totally wasn't a time with a bad mic. So, yeah. um, so here's here's a training game. So, what a training game does is it gives you lots of groups of numbers, and um, they're all in different colors, and they all add up to a multiple of ten. So, this is a surface code based on QDITs. And um, so shall I say what qubits are again? Yeah, yeah, let's explain what qubits are again compared to so, qubits. Yeah, so qubits are, as you've been talking about before, are two-level systems. They can be zero or one or any quantum superposition thereof. Um, but why stop at one? You can also do zero, one, or two. That would be called a three-level qubit. Um, now, these are harder to engineer physically, but uh, in terms of algorithms, they could be more efficient. So there could be reasons to go up to qubits. Uh, so for example, with a classical computer, there was some designed based on three level uh, like bits, minus one, zero, and one, and they were regarded as a much better architecture, but they weren't the ones that we eventually started using. Um, so here we use 10 level qubits, so everything is based on number 10. The qubits are represented by these small squares. And this is a quantum error correcting code. Many qubits all acting together to try and make one big, to make one basically a logical qubit with something stored in this whole thing that is clean. So what will happen is that an error will occur, say here, and that will affect this qubit. So what we do is measurements around each of these squares, and that will tell us something about how the errors have uh, affected all of the uh, qubits around that square. So this is probably a bad example because it's an edge one, but it looks at all of the um, the errors around that square and tells you basically how much they all add up to. So here there's a, been a type of error on this square uh, this skewed it, sorry, which w when this square looked at it, it saw something's happened and I assigned that the number one. If it assigned it the number zero, that means nothing happens, but it's seen something's happened, which I assigned the number one. And this one also sees it because it also has this skewed it, 
but it's defined such that um, it assigns it the number nine, and these numbers, it's not a coincidence, add up to 10. Uh, here we have a couple of errors very close to each other. There'll probably be one there and one there. So this one has um, affected these two, this one has affected these two, and the sum total is that they all add up to a multiple of 10, so 7 out of 2 add 1 is 10. Uh, so what probably happened is that this an error happened here, which made a 7 and a 3, and then an error happened there that, that cracked that 3 into a 2 and a 1. Uh, and these ones here will add up to 20. So if we want to clean up these errors, we just go around moving these numbers together and adding them up, and any multiple of 10 will disappear. So uh, if we add this 7 to this 9, for example, that makes 16, of course, but the, the 10 disappears and just gives us a 6, and then the 6 and the 4 become a 10, so they disappear. Although we've just seen that more things have happened. So in a quantum computer, errors happen over time, and we have to keep track of them. We have to keep actively trying to get rid of them, uh, keeping uh, a record of what they've done. So we have to keep on getting rid of what we've seen, and uh, but we know that more ones will come. Mm -hmm. Now, this game is, is defined, well, it's a game, so it's not defined in quite the same regime as uh, an act, a working quantum computer. It's defined in a regime where um, where uh, more errors happen than we are able to correct. Right. So eventually, we are going to fail. So you would actually want to do your quantum computer in the regime where you can correct more errors than happen to give you a nice margin uh, in case something goes spectacularly wrong. But uh, that doesn't make a good game if it goes on for eternity, although it does make a good quantum computer. So um, what's dictating the refresh rate? So as, as new errors come in, does that just happen randomly or once you've cleaned up? Oh, so all it defines that every five uh, moves, new errors come in. And that gets um, progressively... Um, smaller and smaller as you as No, you... so it's every five moves and then um but basically sort of six errors happen every every five moves but you only have five moves to get rid of six errors so and then what point does it sort of i mean what point is it game over is there a game over yeah i've paused here because uh game over is about to happen mm -hmm. so um as more errors come, they will add to uh, existing groups. So for example, this is a small group, just a five and a five. But if another, another error was to come here, it would maybe split that five into a two and a three, and then you'd have a bigger group. And then more errors happen over time, the groups get bigger and bigger. And as you can see, this green group is pretty huge. Uh -huh. So it starts here, it ends there. Uh, th this is an italic green group, so it, it's uh, slightly different. Um, but once this once any group spans from top to bottom or left to right, then that is when we say, okay, our groups have got too big, they're unmanageable, it's game over. So if I just say, oh, let's uh, let's sort out some of these, then um, eventually something will happen which will bring this so big that it um, touches from top to bottom. So what's the difference between the, the normal text and the italicized text again? So. Um, Every different color is a different group, but there are only so many colors and they're not quite enough for the number of different groups that um, oh, okay. occur. So, ital so italic is basically a different color. So right, it would be right. nicer if this, was, if this turned out to be red, but it turned out to be italic, the same as that one, to make everything a little bit confusing. We can actually induce the game over because if you were to take, say, this one and this one and add them together, then what you're doing is causing those groups to combine. So, so this would all then become the same group. So similarly, if we add this one to this one, then the green group and the italicized green group are going to combine and then game over. So I got a score of 70 there. And apparently so, I have a, a high of five at the moment. But uh, that's... Oh, a high of five. So in, in the main game itself, you don't give this color coding sort of tutorial yeah, so, or training kind so of thing. It's still, oh, sorry, I was talking over you there. Um, yeah. But it's still a higher five because this is a training game. We have the colors just to help us know what's going on under the hood. If you want to actually have your, your score count, 
and you need to do this. So if we were in a training game, this would probably be one color, this would be another, that would be another, that would be another, and this would be another. But we have to work these out ourselves now. We have to look at this and say, well, that's a three and a seven. They add up to a multiple of 10. They're not really that close to anyone. That's a group. Let's move them together. Uh, here we've got a seven and a three. We could say, oh, that's a group. But if we look at it with a greater context, we see that there's another three there, and those two add up to a, three, a seven. So actually, that guy should go with that guy, and that guy should go with those. And if we were to combine them, that would be a mistake, and it would actually bring these two groups together, which would uh, make a bigger group and be bad. So let's not do that. And you can expect to get, uh, once you have played it a few times, uh, you would, can expect to get a score in uh, in the hundreds. So it, like 100 and something is a typical score at the moment. So yeah, this is me just uh, playing now. Uh, I can do this while we, we discuss other matters. Oh my God, this feedback has come back again. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think this microphone feedback starting to creep back in again. Right. Oh, we'll see if it does. Oh no, it might have cleaned itself up. This is strange. So, I mean, we were talking about before, um, in the case of, of, of a qubit surface code, um, yeah. there are methods um, in order to decode this. So, th so this is a classical problem. This is about how do we take the data that is measured by a quantum computer during error correction and be able yeah. to, to reliably estimate what's going on um, physically. Yeah. And that's what it is. It's an estimate. It's a, it's a, it's a best case guess uh, yeah. as to what's happening to the actual qubits. Now, in the qubit case, we can do this efficiently, at least uh, in the sense of the algorithms. They, they scale nicely. Um, you were mentioning before, um, when the microphone was quite bad, then in the case of these QDITs, these, these higher level quantum systems, in, the, in your game's case, 10 level quantum systems, these algorithms don't exist, or at least they're, they're not efficient. Yeah. Yeah, they're a lot worse. Um, well, if you wanted to do it, there's always brute force. So brute force is just where you look at every possible set of errors that could have caused um, these uh, so I'm, I'm not playing in the game at the moment just because I'm trying to get another screen up. Um, but uh, there's always brute force where you look at every possibility and, and add up all of the probabilities and, and you find um, what's uh, the best thing to do. But this is there's exponentially many possibilities, so this really isn't a, a viable option. So you have to use um, other more... Uh, heuristic algorithm. So, well, sometimes, as for the qubit case, we can use uh, minimum weight perfect matching, which is this really nice uh, minimization algorithm. <clears throat> but uh, for the qubit cases, we don't have any uh, minimum weight perfect matching um, generalization to qubits is not efficient. It would still take a lot of time. All of the lovely tricks that we can use to make minimum weight perfect matching efficient, uh, we can unfortunately not use. Uh, in that case. So, so what was um, the, sorry, so aside from the fact that this, this is, was that the primary motivation for the development of this game using QDITs is the fact that um, we just don't have good classical techniques and therefore, as with most yeah. gamified problems, you start with a problem that we know is already difficult. Yeah, so it, decoding in the surface code for QDITs is difficult and our methods are heuristic and that's just a fancy name for uh, we're not really very good at them. And uh, we could just as well make this a puzzle for people to solve and give us some techniques um, that we maybe haven't thought of. Because uh, it, it's not our, our scientific training that's really helping us out sometimes when we're developing a heuristic algorithm. It's just our natural human ability to, to um, solve problems and uh, we can use other people's natural human ability. So in terms of a, a physical system, to my knowledge, nobody is attempting uh, to build a surface code error corrected machine out of these QDITs. Is there any no. benefit to, do, to doing that? Uh, well, trapped ions have a lot uh, more levels than, than, um, than are needed. 
for qubits. So chat terms are quite complicated systems with lots of um, quantum states in, but they just section out two of them to make a qubit, but there's no reason why they can't pick three and make a qubit, for example. So the reason why people focus on qubits is just because most of the fields, most of the theory focuses on qubits and it is uh, easier, but there are people that have done work on how you would do, say, a magic state distillation for qubits and found um, it does offer some some advantages over qubits. So that's, so there are reasons that you might want to try out the qubits. So there, there are particularly there are particular resource benefits with potentially using qubits rather than qubits, even though they're, they're uh, I mean, this benefit would be theoretical in nature because there's still harder systems to engineer. Yeah. But we're still at the, the point where we've got to investigate all options, um, really. Well, it's good, at least theoretically, to investigate all options. And not, because, um, as I said, I think before when uh, the mic wasn't working so well. And it's just not working again. But it seems, it seems to go well and then it goes bad and then it goes well again. Yeah, it's uh, a strange phenomenon. Um, but yeah, there are some who think that we should have used um, the classical version of units to make our uh, normal computers. So, uh, and we, we missed out by not doing that. And it's so good, something that even we might start, we might switch from bits to three network systems. Or uh, our normal computers, but um, so I mean, yeah. your game itself, um, it's a at the moment, it's a 10 uh, sorry, what was it, a seven by seven grid, um, yeah. with a 10 level system. I mean, does um, does your game go larger and larger, or does it basically fix it? Uh, at that? Uh, we, we decided to fix it at that specific size, um, but uh, we'll be looking at developing. The ability to, for more, if a user wants to start going to a prior system, to will develop the software that they can do that. Um, but uh, the main app is, is uh, I think I just put it up the wrong one. Oh, no, well, it says it says now on the screen sharing that you win. So what's the winning condition? We talked about the losing condition. Uh, so this is actually a different app. Um, my other one, which I wanted to introduce briefly so I could uh, talk about how we get data from people. Uh, this is called Dikidoku Puzzles. And this looks at a simpler problem where errors don't keep coming. We just have one set of errors, um, one bunch of errors, and we have to figure out what they're up to. So in this case, there is a win condition. Uh, you can either get it wrong or you can get it right for this specific set. For the other one, it keeps on going over time. So winning just means keeping on for going forever. But in this one, there's a more specific winning condition. Uh, so in this case, we have a grid of numbers. They're all in groups that add up to a multiple of 10. Um, and here we have squares that we don't know what's going on. And we have to try and work out, given that they're small numbers, they're small groups that add up to a multiple of 10, what's going on in these squares. So we can probably see that that's a four in the middle of nowhere ne next to this. So this is probably a six. And here we find, so in this one and in the other one, you can click on, oh, that was an accident. You can click on numbers to, to uh, assign them a color if you wish. And um, you can use this to try and work out what all of these groups are. You can get rid of the groups by adding them up. And um, oh, I think that three might have belonged to that seven. And then we have a six and a four. And then in the end, we find that there's a five in the middle of nowhere, a four in the middle of nowhere. Probably that means there is a five there. Oh, sorry, that was supposed to be a move. And probably that means there's a six there. And then we were right, we win. And it then tells us what all of the groups actually were to tell us why we won or lost. So you basically, in order to, to reduce this, um, you have to solve the puzzle. You don't just say, OK, well, I know that's a six, and I know that is a five. Yeah, uh, you really need the context of everything that's going on to work out. Um, so was this a three and then a seven? That's probably another three time. Yeah. 
I was thinking that three belonged to that seven, but actually it's probably that three, isn't it? This is the kind of thing you have to do. You work out all the groups and you get rid of them. And then, well, hopefully you win. I've not gone into all of the complexities of phi lambda. Maybe I'll leave that for another time. But uh, okay. just to say something on how people can contribute, we have, and I'll have to change my screen share. Sure, sure. sure. So hopefully that's the right one. We have a survey online, so you can find this on our on our website. And this presents some of the kind of puzzles that you might see in the game Digidoku puzzles. And uh, it's your job to try and work out what's going on. So this isn't the app. If I click, nothing happens. This is just a picture. So you can look at this and try and work out what's going on here. This is one that's particularly bad for our current algorithms to deal with, because you see there's an 8 and a 2 here right next to each other. Mm -hmm. It's very tempting to think that they belong to each other, and this 1 and a 9 here. But actually, if you look at it more, if you bring together that 8 and a 2, then you'll have this 8 in the middle of nowhere with no 2 near it. And um, so uh, normal, so this is actually one group. This is another group. And I'm telling you the, the, the answer here. This is another group, and this is another group. So if we were to be have a greedy algorithm which brought those together and brought those together, then that would combine these two groups. So now we'd have one big group with this 8 and a 2, one big group with this 8 and a 2. And then we might be tempted to think this 8 and a 2 go together, and we'd bring them together. And then we have a huge group that spans the whole thing. So we've obviously done stuff that's very wrong. So we really need to think more globally and think, um, OK, I want to put that 8 and a 2 together, but what's that going to mean for that 8 and that 2 if I do that? So we, we think about these. So you have to think about this, and then you can uh, tell us what you were thinking while you um, tried to solve this problem. Uh, so, so, I mean, the, the, the app itself, does that, um, does that feed back information to, to your service, or is it just through these sort of online? So no, data, no data comes through the app, because uh, it's not the, the moves that people make that's really important, but it's the thoughts behind them. We're encouraging people to do their own research rather than uh, just give us data for our research. So in that but letting, oh, And then, so there's multiple puzzles like this, which are very bad for our current algorithms, but they'll give us a, a nice perspective on what people are thinking uh, when they do it. So, so this how, is are, how, how, how's the feedback working? How do people... How do people can you actually solve that puzzle, or is that just, a, or is that just a, an image? Uh, so you, you solve it by, well, you might have to get a pen and paper out to, to, to think about it. But it's just an image. You, you can't, so this is just a Google, uh, Google survey. Mm -hmm. So uh, if, I, if I try and move it around, then as you can see, it doesn't do what it would, done, would have done in the app. Mm -hmm. So you think about it, and then you tell us your answer here. So we've already got a few answers, and someone even uh, wrote it in pseudocode, which was, uh, so we're going to go through all of the contributions that people make, and then we're going to then uh, make blog posts and videos about those and tell people what the community is up to so that so, they can take so, so, sorry, that and build upon it. So give us a bit of a history of the development of this. I mean, uh, this week, uh, this week You've released what is it the second major version? Yeah, so this week we released uh, Dikadoku puzzles. Well, it's been a a few months ago we released uh, Dikadoku on uh, the App Store just to try it out, get people's um, feedback. It, I would call it a beta version, but I'm not allowed to call it a beta version because Apple doesn't have beta versions on the App Store. Right. So it's. Right. Uh, trial version. Um, but, but, uh, so we got some feedback on that. And then we started building the, the Unity version, which uh, deployed on Android as well as as uh, iOS. And so that our big release of the Unity version was uh, yesterday. So that was that's really when everything began. Everything before that is uh, 
is a prequel. Everything began yesterday. That's really when we're we're inviting people to to take part in this research. So I mean, what's the the ultimate goal is obviously to try to make these decoding algorithms better and using yeah. people's own heuristic processes to tell you how hopefully these algorithms do better. Do better. Um, assuming that that happens, I mean, what's is there a next step, or would you be perfectly happy if, if that's the the final outcome of the Dikadoku? Um, so what was that again? Sorry. Um, so I, I mean, your ultimate goal is to to make use uh, people's methods for solving this to to generate a better idea about how to create a decoding algorithm for these yeah. uh, qubit surface codes. Let's let's assume that that happens. Um, mm -hmm. Is there an extension to this project? Is there somewhere else to go? Or you've got your answer. You're you're really happy with that, and that's enough. So it's it's about getting the answer. It's also about getting people uh, involved, involved in the research and and knowing about the research. But once we have better algorithms, then um, that will be ba that's basically the scientific goal of the project. Um, we will we'll add uh, apps on other problems. So specifically in non-abelian anions, which are uh, very hard to decode. We'll we'll add more on that, but. So there'll be more problems within the field to have a go at, but basically we want to get decoding algorithms. So I can see now that you're playing with with a somewhat different version where you've got symbols of, of alpha and phi on the screen rather than numbers. So what's yeah. this? So this is uh, the non-abelian anions. So this is a. So, um, um, we can think of these num. We can think of all of these. Uh, numbers actually as particles and two numbers that add up to a multiple of 10 are each other's antiparticles so a six is a particle we can move it around and the antiparticle of a six is a four so we put them together they disappear and uh, we can add if we combine a two and a one then we get a three uh, but also a three can decay into a two and a one well that's not an operation that i'm allowed in the game but uh that can happen. Now, actually, what kind of particles these are are called uh, non-abelian, uh, sorry, abelian anions. So abelian anions are ones that you always know what happens when you push them together. We always know that a 3 and an 8 will add up to 11, 11 and the 10 will disappear, so it will give us a 1. Um, but with non-abelian anions, you don't always know what will happen when they combine. So here's the phi. So these are phi particles. We can move them around. We can combine them. They might annihilate, as they did there, or they might not. So, for example, if I bring these two phi's together, uh, they didn't annihilate. They became a single phi. Also, sometimes when we bring two phi's together, we can get a lambda. Uh, if we bring those two together, we get um, annihilation. Now, in this specific case, the way we're simulating these, it's actually exactly the same as this, but every time we have a number that is not a five, we replace it with a phi. And every time we have a number that is a five, we replace it with a lambda. But so, so uh, this would be a five. Uh, this would be a phi and a phi that, when combined, would annihilate. But this would be a phi and a phi which, when combined, would not. They would become a phi. And um, let's get this six out of the way. This phi, this would be a phi, and this would be a phi, and they would combine to a lambda. So it's basically the same game, but you're given less information. You know when there are five, so five adds five adds up to 10, lambdas always annihilate. But with the other ones, you have to think a bit more carefully. Do these belong together or not? So, so maybe, give us a, maybe give us a bit of a background on this, because I mean, mechanics and the stuff that I work on is very much related to bits and codes. Um, what you're talking yeah. about here, we were discussed about qubits. And codes. Now you're talking about something different. You're talking about these anionic models, um, which is probably what people think of whenever they hear topological quantum computing. So maybe give us a bit of a distinction yeah. between those two things. Yeah. So in uh, if you had non-abelian anions, then you can use these to store information. So if you've got a couple of phi's, for example, here's a couple of phi's. 
I can use them to store information in that I can take a couple of phi's which uh, annihilate and call that zero. And I can keep, take a couple of phi's which when combined would make a lambda, lambda and I can assign that one and I can use them to store a qubit. And uh, if I keep them far away from each other, there's no way by looking at this and looking at that to know what would happen when we combine them. So there's no way for local noise to see what we've stored and hence mess it up. So this is a, a nice way we can store information that uh, is uh, relatively free of errors. We have to keep track of all of the anions in the background to make sure that they don't mess everything up, but otherwise everything's okay. I mean, and maybe nice just to, to, to elaborate a little bit, is people have never heard of this term before, an anion. Um, yeah. What are these things? So anions don't exist in our universe. So well, we can make them uh, if we have a grid of qubits as we have here. But um, so we can make them as sort of quasi particles. We can they can effectively arise uh, on um, certain condensed matter systems, but they don't exist in our universe. And the reason for that is um, we live in a a three dimensional universe, a universe of three spatial dimensions. Um, and that means that topology in free spatial dimensions means that we can't have the kind of properties that anions allow. And what anions allow is that, say we had these two and they, if we brought them together, they would annihilate. And we have these two and they, if we brought them together and annihilate, the kind of properties that we can have with an anion is if we take this on a walk around the other one, never actually touching it and bring it back to its original place, then that um, act of dancing them around each other can change their state such that if we combine these, they would now become a lambda. And if we combine those, they would now become a lambda. Actually, in this specific model, um, that doesn't happen. These non-abelian anions are, are, are quite rubbish from a, from a dancing them around each other's perspective. But uh, other non-abelian anions would do that. And it means that we can do quantum gates. So if we store a qubit in this one and we store a qubit in this one, in this pair, so in these two pairs, then we could do quantum gates by doing these three sorts of um, what we call braidings, moving them around each other or even swapping them with each other. So this is a completely different architecture for co quantum computation than that you've probably had on your, your channel before. Well, I mean, the, the, the background for, for anionic computing is that, that it's supposed to be intrinsically robust. So in the case of normal qubit system, there might be a thousand or 10,000 qubits, physical qubits, physical atoms or superconducting circuits, in order to encode a single piece of information that can be long lived. But the point of these anions is the intrinsic protection. Yeah. Yeah, they, they, they have very nice properties uh, for protection. I think people have oversold the intrinsicness in that they think that if you just make one of these systems that realizes anions, then uh, it will be the holy grail and you'll you'll do everything easily. You do still have to keep track of, of any stray anions that have been created by, by noise. And that's what you uh, that's what people can contribute to uh, with the Kodoku. But uh, they do have a very intrinsic robustness, both for the non-abelian anions here and for the abelian anions, such as the ones uh, that are involved in the quantics as well. So in the case of, of when you release this game and other um, ways that you've tried to communicate and engage with the general public, I mean, what else have you been getting up to uh, on the release of Ticket Open release? So yesterday we did an, an AMA on Reddit. So. Uh, so that's the thing where you, you go to, so Reddit is a big website, um, one of the, the world's most visited websites. And you can go there and ask people anything. So today you can go to the main AMA site and ask Matt Damon anything. Um, but yesterday it was more exciting because you could ask us anything. <laughs> And how did that so end we, up going? We were not on the... Pardon? How did that end up going? 
it was uh, quite good. So we didn't do it on the main AMA site like uh, like Matt Damon. We did it on the uh, the the science part of Reddit. So new Reddit Journal of Science they call themselves rather grandly here, but it's the the science part of Reddit. Um, so this is still fairly high up, and uh, so it got four thousand upvotes, which is quite nice in comparison with maybe others. Um, and as you can see, okay, this is the browser that talks to me in German, so so uh, you might have to translate a little bit. But um, obviously, all of the comments are in English, so mm -hmm. so um, yeah, it's twenty hours ago, it's still still quite high, high, high. Um, and we had many comments. So the amount of comments on here are around two thousand. So. We have people asking us about uh, programming quantum computers. So I gave a bit of a, an answer on that. We have people asking us about um, big breakthroughs in the field. And it wasn't just me answering. It was, I assembled a team from around Switzerland. Uh, so we had uh, my boss, uh, Professor Daniel Loss, one of his postdocs, Dr. Christoph Klerfel. They were talking about things like um, condensed matter. We had Professor Richard Warburton, who's a, an experimentalist. Lydia Del Rio is in the group of Renato Renner at ETH Zurich, so she does foundation and everything. Uh, Felix is at uh, Geneva. He does experimental quantum cryptography and whatnot. So there's a lot of, and um, I spent um, about eight or nine hours sitting here answering things. Other people answered things too. So if you want to know about quantum computation, here's another place, or any quantum technology, here's a place to go and and read uh, what we said and what other knowledgeable people came and joined in and said. That's great. Um, so, I mean, we'll, we'll link to this obviously down in the description. Um, yeah. People can go take a look. As you said, if there's over 2,000 comments, I'm sure uh, many of the questions that, that other people would have probably already answered there. Yeah. And if you uh, add additional questions, then, then we will try to keep on top of them. We will try, <laughs> but so, there are already so many. I try to ask this of everyone that we have on. I mean, we're approaching nearly an hour, um, which is a bit longer than we usually do, yeah. considering we have mic problems. So we'll obviously go over a little bit. Um, where do you see things going uh, within the field um, in the next five, five or ten years? Certainly, we're getting heavy investment. Um, there is now very strong industry partnerships, uh, whether it's through places like Google or IBM. Um, so from your perspective uh, and from the perspective of people that you talk to in Switzerland, um, what do you see as the eventual five or ten year goal of this whole entire field? So from the perspective of, uh, of me as a, a quantum error correcting researcher, I would be expecting in the next few years to see um, increased experiments in, in, in surface code, so small proof of principle surface codes that can actually correct all quantum errors. John Martinez's group, as I'm, I'm sure you've probably heard from Austin, have done great things, but they can their experiments currently only protect against bit flip noise and not phase flip noise, as far as I'm aware, um, which is a, a great leap forward, but they're going to be now working on uh, a, an actual surface code that can do both IBM as well. So that's going to be the main thing that we're going to see soon. Also, from uh, a perspective in Basel, we work a lot on spin qubits. So, so the, the march towards making spin qubits uh, a very viable um, alternative to superconducting qubits is something that's going to happen. And we've got a lot of um, there's a lot of funding coming in from Intel now because they're very interested on in things that will work with uh, with silicon. So spin qubits we can do with silicon. So um, they're very interested in in keeping silicon going, and they, so there's a lot of money going into that. And I also work um, with uh, with NKIT, which is um, a, an alliance of universities in in Britain. I should say that I work for QSIT, an alliance of universities in Switzerland, and that's who funds this uh, Digidoku project. But I'm also um, talking to NKIT, which is in in Britain, and they're working on trapped ions. So I'm I'm helping them uh, get towards their yeah. Uh, what they call Q2020 goal, which is going to be, again, a, um, a small proof of principle uh, quantum error correcting device. Wonderful. Um, so last question before we, uh, we 
is that there, anything you, well, obviously there's something you want to plug. We've been talking about it through the whole uh, uh, conversation yeah. with the puzzle itself, but uh, any other uh, projects uh, that, that you guys are thinking about launching or maybe are launching in, in the short term or student projects or, or possible ways people can help you out um, beyond simply playing, uh, playing the game? Yeah, so maybe I'll just plug uh, the blog a little bit. So the blog is, is based around the game, but we do have a series of articles on quantum error correction, taking you from, from the basics of classical error correction all the way up to uh, the, the specific science behind our game. Um, and it's, it's written so that it would be accessible to a wide audience. So you don't just have to play our game. If you want to learn something about quantum error correction, you can check out our blog and it'll tell you about surface codes. Uh, so it tells it, there's a big series on the Toric code and other surface codes. So if you want to know the, the science behind Dikidoku, come to our blog. If you want to get, know the science behind Maquonics, come to our blog too. And of Wonderful. course, everything you do. <laughs> Okay, um, so I think that's probably it for today. Um, I do apologize for the mic troubles. Uh, yeah, I'll obviously spend a bit of time and try and clean it up and uh, make it a bit easier to listen to and then possibly upload the, the YouTube version, obviously, with our podcast version. Uh, for those of you who want to buy me a new MacBook. Yeah, I'm not sure what the problem is. We, we have had it before. Um, it could just be a, a Google thing for all I know. It might not necessarily be, uh, be your computer. Um, but aside from that, uh, we will try uh, to upload uh, a new version of this to YouTube and the podcast versions, because obviously we were looking at a bit of a demonstration from James. Uh, and so just listening to this might be a, a bit tricky without the visuals to help out. But we'll try and do our first sort of video podcast up, upload as well. And obviously these days with, with Androids and, and iOS devices, people should be able to, to watch it as well as listen to it. Um, but I'll see what I can do in the next week uh, in order to make uh, make this a, a worthwhile experience for people to download and listen to the to the project from Switzerland. So James, thanks again for thanks joining, for joining us. us. Um, and thanks best so. of luck with the... Uh, with the puzzle and with the, the whole project itself. Yep, and best of luck with Maclinix. We should uh, work together because we're basically doing the same thing. Yes, so, very, uh, much. very much. We'll keep in touch and maybe there'll be a few more videos with us. Yeah, great. No, that sounds like a good plan. Okay, great. Great. Thanks a lot again. And thank you all for, uh, for joining us. So thank you. And uh, I'll try and re-upload this within the week. So thanks again.